Western archaeology began with the first excavation of Stonehenge, England in the late 17th century. Excavations in the Middle East, the land of the Bible and the cradle of civilization did not begin until the mid-19th century. The great Assyrian kings described in the history and prophets of the Old Testament were laughed at by scholars as mere myths produced by a sect of priests in Jerusalem designed to control the people using fear of a coming enemy. There have been hundreds of discoveries made in the Middle East through archaeology, great lost cities buried in the sand, ancient tombs of famous people, monuments left by the kings of the first great empires of Assyria and Babylon. Of all of these, there are two discoveries that have changed the historical record the most. These two discoveries are the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls from 1946 to 1956 and the discovery and excavation of the lost Assyrian capital city of Nineveh from 1842 to 1847, which revealed the massive library of Ashurbanipal, the last king of the Assyrian Empire. This library which remained buried and forgotten since Nineveh fell, contained 22,000 clay tablets written and copied by a succession of empires dating from 2500 BC to the fall of Nineveh in 612 BC. There were also several other similar discoveries in the surrounding region of Mesopotamia, but much smaller than Ashurbanipal's library. Mesopotamia is a name coined by the Greeks of a later time who had heard of the legendary land between the two rivers. The word Mesopotamia actually means land between the two rivers. It is found today in Iraq and Syria between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, two of the four rivers named as surrounding the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. Upper Mesopotamia is the highland area of Syria, where the rivers cross a plateau, and lower Mesopotamia is where the rivers drop into a large, silt-laden, marshy flatland in Iraq. Sumer is the earliest known identifiable civilization on Earth. It is called the Cradle of Civilization by archaeologists. As we will learn, many of today's customs and norms actually came out of ancient Sumerian culture. Sumerian cuneiform is the oldest known system of writing, using over 400 possible letters in their alphabet. They wrote into soft clay tablets and then fired them in a kiln, leaving the oldest known permanent records by the original authors. These clay tablets were at first pictographs, later merging into pictographs with writing and then becoming pure writing. They had a math system with a base of 60, dividing a circle into 360 degrees, a year into 12 months, a day into 12 hours, and an hour into 60 minutes. There are two basic opinions in the secular world regarding how Sumer came to be formed. Both of these are evolutionist-based opinions. The mainstream of archaeology generally takes a very careful and literal approach to in deciphering the evidence they find, carefully cataloging every detail of where and when and how the item was found. To them, there are no gods. These are merely myths made up by men to explain the unexplainable. They follow the literal translation of any writings and carefully build a factual historical record from these findings using changes in alphabet, king lists, common events, and other factors to establish a historical chronology of the region. According to mainstream historians, Mesopotamia is a place where wandering nomads discovered a variety of wild wheat which still grows in Syria. They began to settle in the area and farm the wheat, diverting the river with canals dug into the silt to irrigate the wheat, eventually adding other crops and beginning the very first permanent settlements rising out of the Stone Age. 
Because there is a large body of evidence from Mesopotamia, there has arisen an alternative interpretation of the evidence, which is also evolutionist-based, but not exactly literal. Zachariah Sitchin was an author who wrote a series of books between 1976 and 2007 called The Earth Chronicles. He proposed an explanation of human origins involving an extraterrestrial race of ancient astronauts who mingled their DNA with human DNA to create a base of slave labor in order to mine gold from Earth to save the atmosphere on their home planet Nibiru, also known as Planet X, because it is the 10th planet in our solar system. These aliens also endowed the ancient world with a higher technical knowledge than we have even today. His proposals are based upon an alternative interpretation of Sumerian mythology. And the pictographs, as well as ancient artifacts and mythology from other parts of the world, he also uses some parts of the Bible to support his views. Sitchin has claimed that plenty of evidence has been found already to look at the big picture and come to conclusions rather than endlessly building a case by endlessly gathering evidence as mainstream archaeology insists upon. Sitchin claims that Sumerian and other similar ancient cultures produced their mythologies based upon a phenomena known as cargo cult. The best example of cargo cult occurred in the Malaysian islands of the South Pacific after World War II battles between the Japanese and the Allied forces. These islands were largely populated by Aboriginal tribes who had never had contact with modern technology. First the Japanese came. They airdropped cargo, built runways, set up bases, populated with troops, and then there was a great battle. The Allies then came and built bases with airfields and cargo drops. They had artillery battalions, radios, special forces, night vision goggles. Great battles took place and then the war ended. They all left and when they left, they left behind air bases, bombed out planes, broken artillery and large amounts of cargo junk. These Aboriginal people had never seen anything like it before. They would have been amazed at the sight of a single camera or a single pair of binoculars. Instead, they witnessed the full force of the Japanese and American naval and air battles of World War II for a period of two years. And when it ended, the troops packed up and left. The Aboriginals viewed these events as a great battle among the gods. They began to worship the objects and the experiences by reenacting it in several forms. Their religious practices began to reflect the battles of the Pacific. They rebuilt runways with straw planes and bamboo towers in an effort to make the gods return and bring them more cargo. Their lives had drastically changed during the war and after the war to such an extent that it completely altered their cultural practices in an attempt to understand what happened to them. Zachariah Sitchin claims that the ancient Sumerians were visited in the same way by extraterrestrial astronauts in ancient times and their culture and mythology was affected in the same manner. His interpretations of their myths and pictographs attempt to gaze through the myths for evidence of space travel and scientific knowledge based upon what we know of our own modern science and technology. Sitchin's books have sold millions of copies around the world in several languages. Today there is a large following who hold the same views as Zachariah Sitchin. It is a valid point of view and it is supported by a lot of people who agree. Therefore we must address it and examine the opinions of Sitchin first, and then the mainstream opinion, which will allow us to smoothly transition into the mainstream historical record of the region. According to Sitchin, the pantheon 
of gods in Sumerian culture, their legends and their pictographs, reveal to us a world of high technology which existed in ancient Mesopotamia, including space travel, DNA manipulation, and current knowledge of astronomy and many other modern sciences. Is it mere mythology or is it based upon events that really happened? The double helix formed by two snakes wrapped around a staff is still in use today as a symbol of medical knowledge. This symbol originated in Sumer and is claimed by Sitchin to represent ancient knowledge of the DNA strand. Or perhaps the ancient Sumerians merely saw two snakes mating when they twist around each other and use that as a magic symbol. There is a cylinder seal which depicts the Mother Earth goddess deity called Nimhursag, or Lady of the Mountain, holding the newborn Adam, or worker, whom she created next to a laboratory, as well as the Tree of Life symbol. To Sitchin, this shows the first test tube baby, Adam, the first worker. The Sumerians carried these cylinder seals, which were a small cylinder carved out of precious stone. When rolled in wet clay, they would produce a repeating image. Many thousands of these cylinders are on display in museums around the world today. In the Berlin Museum, there is a cylinder seal showing the god Enlil presenting the plow to his human subjects, representing the birth of agriculture with a representation of our solar system with all of the ten planets revolving around the sun in proper proportion and in their correct positions, except that we haven't found the tenth planet yet. Planet X is the home of the Anunnaki, the name given by the Sumerians to their pantheon of gods. The critics claim that this planetary symbol does not depict a sun in the center because the Sumerians always depicted the sun with wings. When it has no wings, it is a star. The word Anunnaki means those who from heaven came to earth, which is disputed by mainstream interpreters who claim it means sons of Anu, the sky father deity of the Sumerians. Only six planets can be viewed with the naked eye from earth and our ninth planet, Pluto, was not discovered until the 1930s. Therefore, the Sumerians had knowledge of even more planets than we do, and they didn't have a telescope. This information was revealed to them by the Anunnaki. So where is planet X now? It has not yet been discovered by modern astronomy. Some speculate that it is directly opposite the Earth on the other side of the Sun in a similar orbit so we can't see it. Others claim that it is in a huge elliptical orbit around our sun and will return very soon. The Anunnaki were often depicted or symbolized as winged humanoid beings, larger than the other beings in the pictograph, as if they were a giant. The typical idea of the wings was that they had the power of flight, some had two wings, while others had four wings. The Sumerians never equated these honors to themselves. They always attributed these abilities only to the gods, the Anunnaki. Another point of evidence to cover is the ancient monolithic sites and the ancient pictographs describing rocket technology. The spaceship landing pads spoken of are simply the flat top pyramids called ziggurats, which are found in Mesopotamia and in South America. Mainstream archaeology states that these are ceremonial platforms where the local priest would perform ritual sacrifices, while Sitchin claims they could have originally been built as landing edifices for the spacecraft, just as modern rockets need specialized launch pads. There are ancient megalithic stone ruins found in several places on Earth. In eastern Turkey, there are approximately 20 large circular structures involving orthostats, that is, large carved out stone slabs, stood upright 
such as found at Stonehenge. These have been dated at 9000 BC. They depict carved animals, such as lions, birds, and snakes. They are typically about 100 feet in diameter. Hindu mythology is full of gods flying in ancient times, traveling from place to place around India. There is also a large network of stone circles in Africa, which has had several theories attached to their purpose. Everything from mere cattle pens to a finely tuned machine using special crystal containing rock, networked even with the pyramids of Egypt, to provide a source of unlimited energy to the ancient world and to power the ancient mining equipment used by the Anunnaki to harvest gold from the ancient mine shafts found in South Africa. So far nothing definitive has been proven. Most interesting is the pictographs and carvings depicting ancient machinery thought to be spacecraft. There are only a few examples but they are very good ones. The tomb of Hoi in Egypt seems to depict some type of silo, possibly for a rocket, complete with showers at the base of it. Hate to be taking a shower down there when the rocket launches, but it does play on the imagination as to what it represents. Another example is the headless rocket man, a small carving discovered in Turkey among the artifacts in a museum. It looks like a rocket with a headless pilot complete with a spacesuit. Another example is a 7th century AD tomb of a Mayan king named Pascal the Great. This carving seems to suggest machinery like a rocket complete with thrusters and controls. Of course most people had heard of the huge geoglyphs carved into the mountains of Peru which can only be seen from an aircraft or space as if they are signal to ancient astronauts. There are dozens of artifacts that many suggest spaceships or flying craft, but these ones we have looked at are the most popular. There is also the famous flying craft described in the Bible by the prophet Ezekiel in the first chapter of his book. It is quite a long description of a craft used by God to come down to him. It incorporates living creatures with four wings to make it fly but also incorporates mechanical aspects such as wheels within wheels. Today there is a large following of people who believe that these ancient aliens visited the earth and made modern homo sapiens through DNA science and that they were all over the world in ancient times. They also believe that the modern UFO sightings and abductions are evidence that the aliens have come back as if they waited for us to advance and they are taking care of us. There are countless theories as to what they are doing and countless evidence is being presented of their ancient and modern existence with an equal number of rebuttals from scientists. Before we look at mainstream archaeology and the history of Mesopotamia, I just want to summarize what we have reviewed so far. We have looked at the opinion of Enoch, Jesus Christ and the Apostles and early Christian fathers which basically states in one way or another that in ancient times a number of the angelic hosts sinned against God and mated with human women creating a race of superhumans who when they died became demonic spirits who roamed the earth and presented themselves to the world as gods which became the pantheon of pagan deities creating a culture of mankind being duped into serving these demonic forces as gods and the opposing force of God the Creator through Jesus Christ redeeming man and creation from this error into truth. On the other hand there is the opinion of Zachariah Sitchin and like-minded people who conclude that these ancient gods were actually extraterrestrial beings from another planet who came here on rocket ships and created mankind from DNA manipulation as a slave race to mine their gold which they needed to save the atmosphere of their home planet. This visitation created a cargo cult among humans which gave rise to the pantheon of deities around the world. Interesting to say the least, 
For those of you who may not have noticed, these are two opposing interpretations of the same events. The only difference being that one says they were angelic beings, while the other says they were aliens from another planet. The motives of the demonic forces mostly comes from Enoch, which was carried on by early Christians. The motive for the ancient aliens comes from Sitchin's interpretation of Sumerian legends. We will look at some of these legends in more detail later and refer back to this. There is also the modern sightings of UFOs and the abductions. Also, the conspiracy theory that our world leaders have been working with these aliens for years to bring in technology and guide our world. Are those aliens or demons or just imaginations of men? There is no definitive physical proof available. There is a lot of speculation and opinion. You either believe it or you don't. The ancient world is a mighty strange place. We will have a lot of fun looking at it, but we will be looking at it from a modern historical viewpoint in the next episode. See you then.